You're listening to The Drag. We pulled up, if this is the ranch like this, Rancho Santa Elena, the highway actually is over here, and this is all fields, and we came zooming down here, and we came and we parked right here like that. And I'm looking out directly, and I said, oh, I thought to my, I can remember very clearly thinking to myself, oh my God. And I, as I, as I got out of the vehicle, I mean, I had a feeling of evil that I've never experienced in my lifetime, not, not before, not since. Only there I knew that there was something very evil about that place. It was like death was all around us. And um, I remember smelling the smell of decomposing bodies. Um, and I, I still remember that. I mean, that's a vivid memory for me still. On a dry patch of land on the outskirts of Matamoros, Mexico, sits a small ranch. It's called Rancho Santa Elena. It's about a 30-minute drive from Matamoros, which is a coastal border city just across the Rio Grande River at the bottom tip of Texas. The drive from Matamoros to the ranch is mostly on dirt roads, surrounded by farmland. Tamaulipas, the Mexican state that Matamoros is in, is mostly known for agriculture. So driving to Rancho Santa Elena, you'll see maize, sugarcane, tobacco, cotton, and sorghum, the state's most popular crop. Sorghum's a type of plant that's used to make feed for livestock. The fields around Rancho Santa Elena are full of sorghum. The ranch doesn't look like much. A dirt road leads to wooden fencing, and inside the fence, there are a few haystacks, a rundown shack, and a corral for livestock, mostly goats. But on this day, in April 1989, there are no goats, no livestock, no animals at all. It's quiet. Like, it's dead, literally dead quiet. Like, there are no birds making noise, and this is freaking me out. Like, I've never been anywhere out in the open where there seemed to be no wildlife at all. And, like, no birds. That's Siva Varianathan. Back in 1989, he was an intern for the Dallas Morning News Austin Bureau, who was sent to Matamoros to report on a big story. And in April 1989, Siva's just arrived at Rancho Santa Elena. In the days before Siva arrived at Rancho Santa Elena, police swarmed the ranch, looking for clues to a gruesome crime. But today... They didn't rope this off or tape this off like a crime scene like you would see in the United States. There was no concern for the sanctity of the evidence or any further investigation. He finds it odd that police left things this way, but he's there to do a job. Siva spends an hour walking across the ranch. He sees a haystack, and near it are three open graves. They're fresh, too. They've been dug up in the past few days. There are five more graves inside the empty corral, and they're big enough to hold multiple human bodies. When I got to the shack, the most putrid smell came across, and I I still have that smell in my head. Like, I'll never forget what that was like. The shack looks like the kind of building that would normally store things like animal feed, tools, and other supplies for the ranch. But when Siva walked inside, he doesn't see ranching supplies. Instead, he sees something unexpected. And I saw that there was a cauldron where either human blood or animal blood had been boiled down, and and there were bones in the cauldron. At this point, Siva's seen the graves where 14 different bodies were discovered. He's just an intern at the newspaper. When I say intern, it's, um, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's define the terms. I was officially supposed to be part-time. I was paid $7 an hour, no benefits. But most weeks, I went over 40 hours a week. 
Um, so I was, I was pretty much working part time. I'm sorry, full time for no money. Um, but, uh, and, and, and no insurance and no protection. And he's understandably having a hard time processing what he's witnessed. It's so gruesome, he has to leave the ranch. Plus, he's got a story to write anyway. He makes the 30-minute drive back to his hotel room in Brownsville, the Texas city right across the border from Matamoros. He turns in his story, but he can't take his mind off what he's just seen. My heart was racing. Like, I I was kind of overwhelmed. I was very overwhelmed. And I realized I need to get out of this hotel room. So he gets in his car and drives to the ocean. I drove to the mouth of the Rio Grande and stood there where the river pours into the Gulf of Mexico. And, you know, a few hundred feet, I would be in Mexico. Um, uh, And I just stood there and looked out at the ocean and and breathed as deeply as I could. And I was shaking. Uh, I was really messed up. And I'd never felt like this before. And I didn't know why. I must have spent like an hour just standing there on the beach. Um, and I start, it started occurring to me that I had in my sheltered life never, ever encountered violence or any evidence of violence, um, and certainly not of this level. Like, this had blown me away. This had sent me into a not only like a psychological spin, but a philosophical spin. I couldn't make sense of it. It didn't fit into my vision of how the world worked or how humans worked. Siva isn't fully sure what happened. Police are still piecing together what happened on Rancho Santa Elena and what led to those 14 bodies being buried there. Siva doesn't realize yet that this will end up being one of the biggest stories he's covered as a journalist. And it's one that'll stick with him forever. I'm Jackie Ibarra. I'm a senior at the University of Texas at Austin and the host of season three of Darkness. This season, I'm going to tell you the story of Mark Herroy, a 21-year-old University of Texas student who was kidnapped and murdered by a cult in Matamoros, Mexico, in 1989. This is a story that's been covered in the media countless times over the last 33 years. Headlines reading, quote, cult murders in Mexico and the work of the devil stretched across newspapers and magazines in the months and years following Mark Kilroy's death. A handful of books have been written about the case, including one by Mark's father, Jim. It's called Sacrifice, and he co-wrote it with journalist Bob Stewart. It's a heartbreaking account of what the Kilroy family went through and what they still go through. So much of this story has been hard to piece together. After all, it happened in Mexico, before I was even born. But throughout these five episodes, you'll learn about black magic, border culture, and the tragic death of a promising young college student. Just a month before that gruesome scene at the ranch, it's March 1989, and spring break has arrived on South Padre Island. South Padre is a town on a barrier island, just off the coast of South Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley. And it's one of the biggest spring break destinations in the United States. College students from all over the state and all over the country flock to South Padre every March. It's a chance to take a break from the daily stresses of college life. Students catch up with friends, go on a trip, and party. And there's no bigger beach party in Texas than South Padre Island. The sandy beaches, bars, and oceanfront hotels of the island make it a perfect escape for college students. It's far enough away from the hustle and bustle of city life to feel like a tropical getaway, but for Texas students, it's still close enough to be an easy road trip. Every March, cars line up to cross the long stretch of road that connects the island to the rest of the Rio Grande Valley to mark the beginning of spring break. And in 1989, Thousands of students flock to South Padre Island to enjoy everything it has to offer. MTV turned spring break into a cultural icon with its series MTV Spring Break, and South Padre Island made for a wild stage. Students play beach volleyball, soak in the sun on the beaches, and drink a lot of beer. 
Spring Breakers do keg stands and beer bongs and listen to bands like Poison and Milli Vanilli. They participate in belly flop contests and something called the Miss Tan Line contest. A UT Austin biochemistry student, Mark Kilroy, joins the thousands of college students looking to blow off some steam and join in on the fun. Mark's been busy studying for one of the hardest and most career-defining tests yet, the Medical College Admissions Test, or MCAT. He's a pre-med student and a junior, so he's preparing to take the test this summer. So Mark really needed some time away from his books and his dingy apartment in West Campus, the neighborhood where many UT students live. Mark is also looking forward to catching up with three of his best childhood friends, Brent Martin, Bill Huddleston, and Bradley Moore. They've all known each other since they were kids who played sports together in Santa Fe, Texas, a small town in the southeast part of the state, right between Houston and Galveston. Mark and his friends went off to different universities after high school, but they all kept up with each other over the years. This year, they plan to unite and party together in South Padre Island with 400,000 of their closest friends before life pulls them in all different directions. And what better way to kick off spring break than partying in the best spring break destination in Texas? Spring break in, in South Texas and really in South Padre Island, it, it's still the hottest place to come. I, th- I think that you know we we've been we've been like this since since I was in high school in the seventies. That's George Cavito. He was the chief investigator for Cameron County, which includes South Texas towns like South Padre, Port Isabel, and Brownsville. He's retired now, but as a Valley native and fifteen-year veteran of the Cameron County Sheriff's Department, he knows a little something about spring break. There's a lot of interest in coming to South Padre Island. And one, I think a lot of kids just live to, for spring break. I think a lot of kids go to college just so they can come to spring break. Yeah, there's a lot of drinking and music and dancing. But that's kind of the spirit of spring break. Everyone, Texan or not just wants to have a good time before classes call people back to school. For this one week on the island, you can become friends with people you just met and party with them until the sun comes up. And the party is not just on the island or even in the United States. And, and then of course, what, what attracts everybody is that we have Matamoros. So that, that, that in itself uh, brings all the kids down. Uh, going to Mexico and partying, and, and not only that, but they go over there and they buy all their liquor and everything, and they bring it back, and beer, and, you know, everything else. Since South Padre Island and the rest of the valley is at the very bottom tip of Texas, Mexico is close by. So by day, the streets of the island are filled with college students. But by night, thousands of them make the 45-minute drive to Brownsville, Texas. It's the southernmost city in Texas, right on the Texas-Mexico border. And right on the other side of the border, Matamoros. Today, it's known for being a hub of international trade, with giant assembly plans for automobile companies like General Motors, Ford, and Mercedes-Benz, among others. But in 1989, it was a city well-known for agriculture, tourism, and bars that catered to spring breakers. During much of the 1970s and 80s, teenagers could legally drink at 18 in Texas. But in 1986, Texas raised the legal drinking age to 21. But in Mexico, the legal drinking age stayed at 18. So South Padre Spring Breakers were really eager to make the trip into the closest Mexican city. And it was actually really easy to cross the border in 1989 if you were looking to go shopping, go to work, or in the case of Spring Breakers have some fun at the Matamoros nightclubs. This was way before border security tightened. The drug wars would eventually intensify and make Matamoros less safe. Back then, spring breakers would pass a puente, or a checkpoint between the two countries, toss 50 cents in a toll box, and then drive their cars along the Brownsville and Matamoros Express International Bridge. And if they weren't driving, they'd park their cars in a parking lot in Brownsville and simply walk across the Gateway International Bridge, 
the bridge that's made for pedestrians. They'd get asked two questions. What's your citizenship and what is your business in Matamoros? And then they'd be on their way. It takes about five minutes to walk the stretch of bridge into Matamoros. And like any major transportation hub, the area is bustling with the commotion of cars zooming in and out of the country and people rushing back and forth. It might be kind of odd to think about how easy it was to cross the border, listening to this podcast in 2022, but it was actually really common. And like I said, really easy to cross the border in 1989. People didn't consider it dangerous the way we might today. Here's Siva again. There had long been concerns uh, about the safety of UT students crossing the border. But one of the things we have to remember when we think about 1989 or basically any time before 1999 is that northern Mexico was not then known as a particularly violent place. The major concerns for safety that UT students had in those days involved getting robbed, right? That was the most common form of crime uh, that would afflict UT students across the border. The drug cartels in Mexico were definitely operating at this time. That's been going on since the 1960s. But the Mexican drug war didn't really come to head until 1989. That's when most of the fighting between the various cartels in Mexico began. And that's when violence in Mexico really started to make headlines in the U.S., Despite the challenges, many people still travel across the border for various reasons, even today. My family and I used to travel to Mexico from San Antonio. Usually, we'd visit my grandma, who I call Ama, or we'd have a craving for a meal we just couldn't find in my hometown of San Antonio. We'd also go for less exciting reasons, like getting a dental filling. I have plenty of memories of sitting in the car, smiling at the checkpoint camera excitedly because, well... Mexico was one of the few places my mom would let me order soda. Most times, it was an orange jarito, a type of Mexican soda that you can find in the United States, but it tastes better in Mexico. Many other families make the trip across the bridge, and not just when they wanted a jarito. Some people cross back and forth every day. Sometimes young children trek along the bridge to attend school in the United States. And other times, it's people who need to cross for work. But the Spring Breakers crossed for a very different reason. Cheap drinks and a good time. The Rio Grande Valley in Texas is culturally pretty similar to Mexico. In some counties, as many as 97% of the residents identify as Hispanic. But even though the valley shares a lot of similarities with Mexico, once you cross that bridge between Brownsville and Matamoros, it's a whole new world. Matamoros is a pretty big city. In 1989, the population was about 239,000. It's the second largest city in the Mexican state of Tamaulipas. The Dollar Generals and Ross Department stores of Brownsville are replaced by the brick buildings of Mercados, small stores that sell everything you could possibly need. The buildings are a bit more colorful, despite the wear and tear of the summers. And even the air feels different here. It might be because of the mountains off in the distance, or the heat of the fajitas wafting through the air from local restaurants. But in 1989, the real attraction for the Spring Breakers is just past the border. In downtown Matamoros, where bars like Senor Frogs, the Hard Rock Cafe, Sgt. Peppers, Los Sombreros, offer beers for just a dollar. Signs read, quote, Welcome Spring Breakers, and the nightclubs are packed wall to wall with students from nearby states like Texas and Oklahoma, and even farther, colder Midwestern cities. So it's pretty obvious why Mark Hiroy and his friends wanted to head to Matamoros for the night. They wanted to be right where the party was. Hi, I'm Lauren. And I'm Chandler. And we're the hosts of Pop Apologist Podcast, a weekly podcast devoted to celebrity gossip, Hollywood deep dives, Real Housewives drama, and anything and everything Taylor Swift. We're two sisters who make no apologies for our love of pop culture and the fact that A-listers might mean more to us than each other. 
Join us on your favorite podcast app every Wednesday for Pop Apologists. Pop Apologists, your new favorite sister and celeb podcast. Mark Kilroy is six feet tall, blonde, and clean cut. In the photos that will circulate after his disappearance, his hair is cut short and he flashes a wide grin. He looks friendly, like someone who'd share class lecture notes with you or help you fix a flat tire. He just turned 21, less than a week before spring break. Remember, he's getting ready to take the MCAT, so he's excited for the break. Mark's had a busy few years. UT is the third Texas college he's attended. He started at Southwest Texas State to play basketball. Then he played basketball for Tarleton State before transferring to UT. His friend, Ryan Fenley, told me that Mark was laser-focused on school, and he really wanted to succeed so he could become a doctor. He left basketball because he wanted to focus on his studies and finish his degree from UT and then go to med school. He wanted to either go to the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston or a med school in Houston. Either way, he wanted to be near his hometown of Santa Fe, Texas. He was gifted in that area. Um, you know, academically, you know, he's good at chemistry and math and the sciences. So for him, it was a good fit to become a medical doctor. On Friday, March 10th, 1989, classes on the University of Texas campus released for spring break. One of Mark's friends swings his Mustang into Mark's apartment complex parking lot, ready to make the three-hour drive home to Santa Fe, Texas. Ryan Friendly didn't grow up with the boys, but he met through a mutual friend. I went down to college in Galveston in the spring of 88. That was when I transferred from San Jacinto College to Galveston College was the spring of 88. And the first person I met down in Galveston was Bill Huddleston, which was Mark Kilroy's good friend. And that's what started the whole circle. Ryan was supposed to go on this epic spring break trip, but he canceled at the last minute. I just kept hearing something in my ear saying, don't go. And finally, that voice got louder and I listened to it. And the rest is history. Ryan ran into one of his professors the week before spring break. She encouraged him not to go party in South Padre and go snow skiing in New Mexico instead. So the other boys planned to go to the beach without Ryan, and Ryan said Mark was really excited for this trip. Good guy, uh, played by the rules, uh, you know, you know, doesn't look for trouble. Just went down there to have a good time, uh, meet some people, drink. And just get away from the studies because his, uh, the spring of 89, that semester at UT was a tough semester for him. And he just needed a break during, during, we call it, you know, uh, during spring break, that's kind of like your midpoint. And he just needed a break. On the drive home from campus, Mark and his friend talk about how this upcoming summer might be their last one together. The last one where all four guys in their friend group will be together before they graduate college and inevitably go their separate ways. They get caught up talking and Mark gets distracted while driving. And they get lost. The drive takes them an hour longer than expected, but they don't mind. It's quality time with a good friend. They make it to Santa Fe just before sundown. Santa Fe is a pretty rural community with all the trademarks of a small town, one high school and some mom-and-pop businesses. In 1989, the population was around 8,500 people. Houses here have long driveways and big yards. Most people tend to have some kind of farm animal like chickens or goats. It's the kind of small town where everyone not only knows their neighbor, but likes them too. The Kilroy family, Mark, his parents Jim and Helen, and his brother Keith have lived in Santa Fe for about 15 years after moving from Illinois. Jim works in the oil business, and Helen's a stay-at-home mom. They've got a few animals, cows, goats, chickens, and they're devout Catholics. It's an appropriate place for them to live. Santa Fe means holy faith in Spanish. Mark makes a pit stop at his family's house. According to Jim Carroy's book, Sacrifice, 
Mark's parents are understandably relishing this time they get with their oldest son. And Keith, Mark's 19-year-old brother, wants to show off his brand new bright red sports car to his big brother. Ryan Fenley told me the Kilroys were a loving and tight-knit family. Very nice guy. And, and, it was, and the nice thing I liked about Mark, he was a Christian too. It's a pretty regular family evening. Mark waits for his friends to come over so they can get on the road. In the meantime, he brought home a pile of laundry for his mom to do, like a typical college guy. And he talks with his dad about playing golf together when he gets back from spring break. Mark and Keith take that new sports car for a spin and make plans to share an apartment the following school year when Keith plans to join Mark at UT Austin. Helen brings out a birthday cake with a single candle on it to celebrate Mark's 21st birthday the week before. And then they say their goodbyes. Helen worries about the boys driving to South Padre so late at night, but they reassure her that there's nothing to worry about. It's the last time Jim and Helen Kilroy will see their son alive. Mark reunites with his friend and they go pick up the other boys. After so many stops, it's not until after midnight that they get on the road for a drive that would normally take about six hours. But it's unexpectedly foggy out. And the drive from Santa Fe to South Padre is mostly on poorly lit two-lane highways. So they have to take it slow. It ends up taking them nine hours to get to the island. But when they arrive Saturday morning, they don't feel like sleeping. It's mid-morning, but the party at the Sheraton Hotel on the beach is already raging. Students from all over the country make their way to the beach. Music's blasting, and there's plenty of beer, and the boys waste no time joining in on the fun. Here's Ryan again. Oh my God, it was fun. It was, everybody looked after one another. Uh, people would just drink, flirt, party. Uh, people would come together and go places. I mean, uh, I mean, like when we had planned that trip, the hot thing, you know, the, the main thing uh, to go to down there for spring break was for drinking, partying, and flirting with the opposite side. Ryan wasn't there since he went skiing instead, but even more than 30 years later, he remembers everything his friends told him happened that week. I mean, like, uh, the first night after they checked at the hotel at South Padre, you know, they were tired because... My friends drove from Galveston to South Padre in the middle of the night. So they had, they, they kind of, uh, you know, slept in the car on the way down. But by eight, nine o'clock, things were in the morning, things were pumping and going. And so they went, you know, they went, they went to this contest and it was just energy, just energy everywhere. That contest Ryan's talking about? It's that Miss Tanline contest I mentioned earlier. It's kind of like a pageant on the beach where female spring breakers show off their tan lines to an admiring, mostly male crowd. After a jam-packed, suntan first day, the boys call home to make sure their parents know they're okay before heading back to the hotel. Mark's parents don't answer. But even after driving all night and partying all day, they don't sleep. If I would, you know, you didn't meet friends that could be friends for life, Um, you know, just through going to spring break. But it's, um, you know, and then you met people from all over the country going to colleges and universities from all over the country because they would come down to spring break. But in Texas back then, especially Texas, everybody will, I don't care what university you were attending or what community college you were attending, everybody was off the same week. So that's what made it so big. It turns out that their hotel neighbors are a group of girls from Purdue University who invite them over to dance and party until the sun comes up. Totally normal spring break behavior. Like Ryan said, on spring break, everyone is your friend and sleep is on the back burner. So on Sunday, March 12th, they just keep the party going. They catch a few hours of sleep before heading to the beach to tan. 
Then, of course, they can't miss the daily Miss Tanline contest right after lunch. They have time for a nap to recharge before heading to the main event of the evening, the popular party scene in Mexico. The plan is to make the 45 minute drive to Brownsville, leave their car in the lot, and walk across the International Bridge to join the rest of the partygoers in Matamoros for a night of drinking, dancing, and fun. All the bars and clubs and restaurants really marketed to all the young、uh, spring breakers because of the dr- lower drinking age. And uh, so uh, that was the thing. But of course, they needed to fuel up before heading to Brownsville. So the four stopped at a Sonic Drive In, the fast food chain that's a staple for its half price appetizers and late night service. In the drive through line, they see some girls in front of them. They're from the University of Kansas, and Mark gets stared by his friends to ask them to party. After all, Mark's the kind of guy that can talk to anyone. Soon enough, the girls join the boys for a night full of cheap drinks and dancing in Matamoros. They make it to Brownsville at around 11 p.m. and walk across the bridge. They get asked the same questions as anyone else, but the questions come with a warning. Border Patrol, who, bordered, who oversees the Gateway International Bridge, which is the main bridge that crosses over from Brownsville to Matamoros, they told all the college kids. If you're going to go over here at night, stay in groups and be careful of your surroundings. They start their night at a bar named Sergeant Peppers. It's common for these bars to have English names since so much of their customer base is made up of young Americans. Some of them even change their names during spring break to appeal more to American customers. The group parties until 2 30 in the morning, dancing to music and downing cold beers. They eventually make the trek back to Padre and get some much needed rest so they can wake up the next morning and do it all again. Hi, I'm Lauren. And I'm Chandler. And we're the hosts of Pop Apologist Podcast, a weekly podcast devoted to celebrity gossip, Hollywood deep dives, real housewives drama, and anything and everything Taylor Swift. We're two sisters who make no apologies for our love of pop culture and the fact that A listers might mean more to us than each other. Join us on your favorite podcast app every Wednesday for Pop Apologists. Pop Apologists, your new favorite sister and celeb podcast. It's Monday, March 13th, 1989, and the boys haven't gotten much sleep, besides sneaking in a couple hours here and there. But the blue waters, the cloudless sky, and the music blaring from the speakers c a u s e them to hit the beach again. From their hotel room balcony, Mark and his friends can see the party starting and they have to be there. They waste no time getting to the beach. They dance in and out of the water. Mark and his friends run into childhood classmates, frat brothers, and people they know from school. It seems to be a perfect day of fun and friendship. The party's in full swing, but somehow it still feels like it's just getting started. Later that night, Mark and his friends head to a condo party hosted by one of his former frat brothers he saw at the beach earlier. Then someone mentions going back to Matamoros for the night. Two of the guys are tired. They've been partying for what feels like days and they need some rest. But one of the guys wants to follow the party, and the party is headed to Matamoros. Mark doesn't really care where they go. He's there with his best friends from childhood on an island with so much to offer. So, no surprise, the four of them ultimately decide to hit the streets of Mexico again. So, by 10 30 that night, Mark and his friends make the trip down to the border and they're ready to hit the town again. This time, Mark drives and cars are sandwiched at the border. Just like last time, they parked on the US side and crossed by foot. When they get there, the music is bumping from the bars and they're corralled between all the students there, too. There's so many American students around, it almost feels like they're still in the States. They first hit Los Sombreros Bar. After a few drinks, Mark and his friends join the rest of the crowd and stroll down Avenida Alvaro Obregón. It's the main road where all the bars and restaurants are lined up. They walk until Mark and his friends wander over to a bar called London Pub. But the bar rebrands itself as the Hard Rock Cafe during spring break. 
mostly to help attract more of the American students who stroll along the streets. Here's Ryan again. My friends were bar hopping. They walked into a club called the London Pub, which is in Matamoros. And Mark recognized a girl sitting at the bar for a moment by herself. Mark strikes up a conversation with the girl who he recognizes from the Miss Tanlang contest in South Padre. And he'd recognized her immediately and struck a conversation with her. Mark was going to UT and she was a student at Southwest Texas State in San Marcos. And they hit it off and the rest is history. Mark and his friends spend the night hopping from bar to bar, drinking, dancing, and talking to girls. By now, it's almost two in the morning, and the guys are feeling the effects of the alcohol and constant partying. So the friends step out of the Hard Rock Cafe and see Mark. He's leaned up against a parked car and talking to the Miss Tanline contestant. The boys try to walk towards Mark, but there's so many people there. And since it was so close to closing time at the bars, all of the thousands of students there are making their way back to the border. It's almost impossible to disrupt the flow of people walking back to the border. It's easy to get separated from your friends. Bradley Moore and Brent Martin end up towards the front end of the crowd, trying to lead the group out. Bill and Mark are somewhere in the back, just a few steps behind them. Again, there's so many people trying to get home or rushing back towards the bars for one last drink. It's chaotic, it's loud, and it's pretty dark. The boys don't see Bill and Mark yet, so they decide to wait for the others to catch up. They wait at Garcia's, a popular restaurant and gift shop close to the U.S. border, like so close you could see Texas from the front door. Bill and Mark are falling farther and farther behind in the crowd, but Bill still isn't feeling that well, and now he really needs to use the restroom. The bars are either almost closed or are swarming with people, and it's still a 45-minute drive back to the island. So Bill decides to go to the restroom in one of the alleys near the main road. He runs off and leaves Mark in the crowd. He's gone for a few minutes, and when he comes back, Mark is nowhere in sight. He's just disappeared. He was actually separated from our friends for about four minutes. Four minutes, that's all it was. Mark was there, Mark was gone. It was just that simple. Bill calls out to Bradley and Brent, but they didn't see Mark pass them. They're surrounded by thousands of students, but none of them are Mark. They think maybe Mark went on ahead and he's waiting for them on the other side of the border. So the boys head back to the parking lot in the United States, but Mark's not waiting by the car. Two of the friends stay behind and watch the crowd coming out of the bridge for Mark, while Bill plunges back into Mexico. Maybe Mark's in a bar, or maybe he stopped to talk to someone he knew on the way to the bridge. After all, they've ran into some of his old friends. But it isn't like Mark to just disappear without telling anyone. Here's Ryan again. He would never just go wander off and disappear. But the culture at the time is, This was spring break. Everyone does this, you know, kids party, they drink, they meet someone, they wander off, and they always, you know, come back. So Bill starts retracing their steps. He hits the bars from earlier, Los Sombreros, then the Hard Rock Cafe, and he's not there. He starts checking every bar he sees. On Avenida Alvaro Obregón, there are plenty of bars to check, but still, nothing. He searches every restroom, every alleyway, every street corner for any glimpse of his friend. And he's pushing his way through the wave of students rushing towards the border. He feels lost until he runs into a fellow Texas A&M student who has a car and knows Matamoros pretty well. Bill and the student drive around to take one last look for Mark. They drive up and down the streets and around corners, but still, there's nothing. By now, it's four in the morning and the streets have emptied, the bars have closed, and most of the students have gone back to the United States. It's quiet. 
Discarded beer bottles line the streets. Bill returns back across the bridge to the United States with Bradley and Brent. Maybe Mark's there. Maybe he made it across and no one caught him. But when he approaches the car, Mark still hasn't shown up. But there's still a chance Mark caught a ride back to the island with someone. After all, it is spring break and everyone seems to know everyone this time of year. And Mark's really good at making friends. So maybe he's already back at the hotel. The three friends head back to the island. They get back to the hotel around 5 a.m. and they wait and wait and wait until eventually the exhaustion from the partying and the worrying takes them to bed. By the time the boys wake up, it's already 2 p.m. and it's been about eight hours since they've last seen Mark in the streets of Mexico. They wake up in the hotel and Mark's still not there. Now they're really worried. They decide to head to the police station on the island and then head back to the border and maybe ask for help at the bridge. They have no idea what to do or who to even go to. Mark could still be somewhere in Mexico, so they'll have to ask police on the Mexican side too. And this isn't really something that happens on spring break. Not in 1989. Spring breakers are usually pretty calm. I think the biggest thing there is is alcohol. And, you know, and even with alcohol, they kind of give them a ride and take them home and stuff. But crime, there's not that much. That's George Cavito again, the investigator in Cameron County. He's seen a lot over the years and a lot on the island, but not so much serious crime involving spring breakers. And yeah, there is a lot of drinking and partying, but... Someone going missing is definitely out of the normal. And even if students do drink too much, Gabito says law enforcement usually just gives them a ride to wherever they're staying. Or maybe they'll write them a ticket for drinking or being in possession of alcohol, but nothing too crazy. And it's kind of the same in Mexico. You go to Mexico, but they pretty, pretty well, you know, kind of take it easy because they don't want to get arrested in Mexico either because it's going to cost them money and everything else. So So most of the time, spring breakers wouldn't get too rowdy. Worst case scenario, they get a ticket or maybe they spend the night in jail until the bond was paid. Then they get out and go home the next day. It's not a fun night, but it's nothing too serious or dangerous. So the boys head down to the border to look for some help and end up outside of the United States Consulate General in Matamoros. There are about nine different consulates around Mexico, and this one in Matamoros was made to help coordinate commercial ties and visas between the two countries. But when an American needs help or is in trouble in a foreign country, in this case Mexico, they're usually the ones you contact. But officials at the consulate tell the boys not to worry. Mark will turn up. They're convinced he's probably just in jail or in the hospital in Matamoros. But that's not what Mark's friends thought happened. Here's Ryan again. For Mark to have just vanish and just disappear was, you know, they, people thought back then, even the, you know, Cameron County Sheriff's Office, who was doing the investigation when Mark disappeared, um, they thought, you know, oh, spring, oh, that happens all the time in spring break. College kids walk away. They go meet up with a girl. They go do this. They go do that. But that's not the way Mark's character was. That's why they're like, no, I don't think you understand. This is out of his character. This He wouldn't have done something like this. By the time the boys return to the island, it's 10.30 p.m. And they've been everywhere. The South Padre Police Department, the American Consulate, and they even hit the streets of Mexico again. And still, no Mark. The boys know they have to tell Mark's family news no parent wants to hear. So Bill makes the call to Mark's family back in Santa Fe, Texas, and breaks the news to Mark's mom, Helen. She's in complete shock. Only her and Mark's brother Keith are at home, and neither of them know what to do. After all, Mark is presumed missing in a totally different country. So they call Jim, Mark's father, who's in West Texas on a work assignment. 
According to his book, he's also in complete shock. He didn't even know Mark was planning on going to Mexico, and now he's being told that his oldest son is missing. But when he focuses, he tells Helen to call his brother, Ken Kerroy, Mark's uncle and godfather. Ken's a customs agent, so the family thinks he may be able to help. When they reach Ken, he promises to use any connection he has in his job to start the search for Mark. The Kilroys try to call the police in Matamoros, but no one there speaks English. Keith has your basic high school Spanish class proficiency and is only able to mutter that his brother is lost, but the police aren't able to help. The Kilroys keep making phone calls to anyone they think could help them find Mark, but it gets too late to make any more calls. All they can do is wait and pray for Mark's safe return. But they don't realize their prayers are fruitless. Mark Kilroy never left Mexico, and he'll never come home. Next, on season three of Darkness. I was sitting in my office, and one of the secretaries came in and said that there was a couple of kids there that Brownsville PD had sent over. They had gone to Brownsville PD to report a missing person. And they said, well, it happened in Mexico. Why don't you go talk to George Gavito? And George Gavito takes all kinds of cases. So, and that's exactly what the guys told me when they got there. So, so they came in and they started telling me the story uh, that they had a buddy missing. I said, well, what happened? Uh, we're, we were, we were in, in Mexico and uh, we started coming back and we crossed the bridge and we waited and waited and waited for him and he never came over. This season of Darkness is reported, hosted, and produced by me. Jackie Barra. Katie Penchik-Alka and Robert Quickly are the executive producers. This podcast is presented by The Drag, a student-run audio production house at the University of Texas at Austin's Moody College of Communication. Sewa Olivares is the lead sound designer and editor for this season of Darkness, and the assistant editor is Heather Stewart. Special thanks to Marian Navarro for being the lead reporter on this story when this project first began. The associate producers are Emily Rubin, Megan Kirby, Jake Herman, Khadija Balde, Bethany Stork, and Miranda Vilches. The artwork was designed by Helen Holsey and Alexa Georgilos. Sofia Vargas Garam is the Drag's Marketing and Communications Manager, and Grace Robertson is the Drag's PR Manager. Christian McDonald is our Technical Director. Special thanks to Bob Buckaloo at KVU TV in Austin for all his time and effort finding archival footage for us to use in these episodes. And thanks to KVU for letting us use the audio. A huge thank you to Leslie Schrock for all her support and guidance. We also want to thank Jay Bernhardt, David Reif, Rachel Davis Mercy, Allison Dawson, and Kathleen Mabley of the Moody College of Communication. The Drag is a nonprofit educational organization that is made possible by donors like you. Please support our work by going to thedragaudio.com slash donate. Every dollar goes directly to producing more content like this while giving students like me an amazing educational experience. Thank you.